And we're going to be studying in one of the, one of the greatest subjects in all of the world. It's, uh, it's because of the fact that we look forward to the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and all the things that take, take place along with that. And most of you know the sequence of events that takes place, but just in case there's someone here that doesn't, uh, concerning the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the next great event to take place is going to be the rapture. Is everybody listening to me? Yeah. All right. The rapture of the church. Uh, the, the Bible calls it the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. It's when our Lord Jesus Christ comes back uh, in the clouds of glory, and at that moment, the Scripture tells us that every, every saved person, both those that are in the grave and those that are, are saved, uh, the church throughout the world, will suddenly, without no notice or notification, will suddenly be caught up together in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And that means the graves are going to break open, the bodies of those who are in the grave are, are going to suddenly be caught out and reunited with the soul and spirit and caught, caught up together in the clouds to meet the Lord Jesus Christ in the air. Now, we've had that taught to us so much that we, we kind, of, kind of overlook it, uh, the importance of it and the excitement of it and the joy of it. And the scripture tells us, tells us that we should look forward to that every single day, that Christ Jesus is coming back. You know, the scripture tells us that he was to come the first time, and I'm sure Israel watched uh, for his coming, uh, that is the saved of Israel watched, but it became kind of a redundant, uh, redundant thing and people just, it became commonplace so that people didn't look for the first coming of Christ. And Jesus came the first time just as the scriptures promised that he would. Well, the scripture has promised us that he will come in the clouds of, glo of glory to catch away his bride, the church, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now, the next great event after that, that doesn't end, that doesn't end the, the earth. That doesn't end the people on the earth because we're caught away, transformed, given new bodies, in, caught up into the clouds, and we're with Christ. But then the Bible says there's a, uh, there's a period of time, seven years, that's called the Great Tribulation Period. It's a period of seven years in which God will deal with uh, the nation of Israel and because of the fact that Israel has rejected their Messiah, they've been set aside for all this time uh, since the day uh, that they rejected their Messiah and crucified him on the cross. God has set Israel aside, and uh, they have been uh, wanderers in the world ever since that time. They have, they basically, they have no God, they have no temple, they have no sacrifice. And so God has set Israel aside for these last seven years uh, the tribulation is called in order to deal once again with the nation of Israel and bring them back to him. So as you look in the world today, you see Israel existing after these 2,000 years of wandering in the wilderness, you might say, and Israel is, is, a, is a nation once again. And so it's not going to be long till we see God dealing with this nation of Israel. And he already is, basically. But there's going to be the seven years that takes place. So that's the main thing we're going to be studying about today this is the Great Tribulation period. It's a very important period. It's a time of, of harsh judgment on the earth, not only for Israel, but it's going to be a punishment for those people who have rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. And I, I think of, uh, you know, I've read, been reading a lot of stuff lately on creationism and on uh, atheism, and basically our world is turning atheist. Uh, the, the root the, the root of, uh, of, of atheism is, is uh, uh, evolution. And evolution is just a part of the, of the doctrinal theory of, uh, of the atheist. And so the truth is that our, all of our country, basically, and most of the world has been taken over by atheism. And even though we, they tolerate us a little bit, they allow us to have, our, you know, to have our religious services as long as we keep it within the confines of our walls. But... Uh, but that's all. You, that's, they don't want you in, in politics. They don't want you in the social part of, of the world. They don't want you in the public school system. They don't want you teaching anything that has to do with, with the real, true, and living God that created everything. Now, let me tell you something. That's one of the most wicked things that can ever happen in the world, that men should turn against God. And so as a result of that, when this great tribulation period comes, God is going to take his wrath out upon the people who have for all these times and centuries, and I think especially the United States of America, 
who has been so blessed with, uh, with the gospel, with the goodness of God, with the, with the blessing and uh, all the, the wealth that he has bestowed upon us, and yet in spite of that, America, in its, in its, all, its government and everything, has turned their face against God, and uh, as a result of that, this great tribulation period is going to include the punishment of, of America and all the nations of the world that have forgotten about God. And so, if you read the book of Revelation, you'll see there uh, some of the terrible, terrible things that's going to come upon, upon the unbelievers of the world. So it's the seven year period of, of tribulation is a time of God's judgment on Israel and God's judgment on the unbelieving world. It's gonna be a terrible time. Now, we're gonna get into Matthew chapter 24 and it's, a, it's, a, it's an exhilarating chapter. It's a chapter that, that when Jesus teaches his disciples, it's like he is looking forward down through history to the time when the tribulation period will begin and there will be disciples, there'll be saved people during the tribulation period. Now the scripture tells us that there'll be 144,000 young Jewish virgin men who will be converted, kind of like the apostle Paul was, and they'll all have similar zeal, they'll have powers, uh, they'll have knowledge and wisdom and grace and gifts. I think the uh, 144,000 will be able to go into all the world and speak in languages that perhaps they have not learned because the scripture tells us as we go along, you'll see that the whole world is going to hear the gospel. Now at this present moment, there's probably at least half of the world that has never heard uh, about the Lord Jesus Christ and how to be saved. But these young Jewish uh, men are going to be saved at the beginning of the tribulation period. That is right after the rapture takes place. Uh, now the rapture is going to take place and as, as quickly as it takes place, then shortly after the rapture takes place, then, uh, then begins the tribulation period. And right at the beginning of it, these 144,000 young Jewish men are going to go as ambassadors throughout the whole world, speaking to every single tribe and person that there is across our world, and everyone will hear the gospel. Now, not everyone will be saved, but there'll be a lot of people who will be saved during the tribulation period. There'll be great persecution of Christians, and we'll see that as we go along here. But the tribulation period is going to be a time of harsh persecution for everyone who names the name of Christ. So here in Matthew chapter 24, we begin with verse 1. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him to show him the buildings of the temple. So they were very excited about the beauty and the buildings of the temple, and they took the Lord, they were going with the Lord through and pointing out all these wonderful things. And Jesus stopped abruptly and said in verse 2, And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be one left here, not left here, one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. So this is, this is a, I guess he stopped them cold and surprised them when he told them that all these, all these rocks, these huge rocks of the temple, and they were huge, they were great monstrous building rocks, that all those rocks would be suddenly torn down. And uh, of course we know that that took place about 70 AD when Titus, and his armies came in and literally destroyed the temple and not one rock was left upon the other. So that prophecy was fulfilled in 70 AD. And then he goes on in verse three we read, and as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately saying, tell us, when shall these things be and what shall be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Now they ask him two questions here. When are these things gonna be? Uh, that is, when is the temple gonna be destroyed? But the next question is the most important of the questions and they said, and uh, what shall be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And so now he, although these 12 disciples that ask him this question will not be among those that these scriptures pertain to, which is going to be in the, in the, far, in the far future, when Christ Jesus comes back again, those disciples, of course, of course, are going to be in heaven. But these next verses are, are directed at Christians who will be saved during the tribulation period and, uh, and so they'll know exactly what to expect. So he's, he's warning his disciples in the, during the tribulation ahead of time. Verse four, now the rapture has taken place somewhere between verse three and verse four. And so verse four basically begins the, the, the teaching about the tribulation period. And that's what Jesus is saying here. In verse four, it says, and Jesus answered and said unto them, take heed that no man deceive you. 
So you're going to see as we read through that deceit is going to be a part of the seven year tribulation period in which Satan is using every deceitful power and knowledge and wisdom that he has uh, to lead people away from the, from the truth of the gospel. So it's going to be a, a, a seven year time of deceit among the peoples on the face of the earth because Satan knows that these last seven years are basically his lost opportunity unless he does all that he can. So he's going to, he's going to do everything possible. If we see, as we go along, we'll see that he is, he's going to do things, per, perform miracles, do all sorts of things to make people believe that he or that, that the prophets that he sends out are going to be uh, the prophets of God to deceive people. Verse 5, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and shall deceive many. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. Uh, see that you not be troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. So here's, here's one of the things he tells the disciples that are, that are going to be there during the tribulation. There's going to be wars and rumors of wars. So this is one of the marks of the seven-year tribulation period. There's going to be war everywhere. We have never seen uh, war in the earth like there will be at this time. <clears throat> nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and... Uh, we in America have been kind of, uh, we've kind of kept, been kept apart from, from wars for, for quite, a, quite a number of years here. And so we know nothing about war except those of us who have gone to, to the battlefields and have fought over there. But those of you who have know that war is a terrible thing. It's devastating. It's, uh, it's heartbreaking. And this is what's going to be a, a part of the tribulation period throughout the whole world. War is going to be everywhere. Verse 7. Nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines. And this is another mark of the tribulation period. During this period, food is going to be in short supply all across the world. Right now, I, they tell us that in Africa and some of those places, there are famines that literally destroy hundreds of people every single day. They starve to death, little children that starve to death as a result of no food. And we know nothing of that either. We are here fat and sassy and enjoying the, the blessings of God in our country, but yet across the world we see people now who are starving. That's going to be commonplace uh, during the time of the tribulation. People are going to be starving to death all over the world. So there's going to be uh, famines, there's going to be pestilences, and this is going to be diseases. Uh, diseases perhaps that have never been heard of before, and all the time we find, now we find that there are new diseases coming in that are uh, that our uh, medications can't take care of because their 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 mutations take quick take change so quickly. So we see things like AIDS and uh, all the horrifying things that AIDS have done across Africa and other parts of the world. In our country, there have literally been thousands of people who have died as a result of AIDS. Uh, I personally believe that AIDS is a curse from God, and I think it's a curse upon those who insist upon living a lifestyle that is in rebellion against God. Well, this is going to be a common thing in the, in, the, in the tribulation period. There's going to be diseases every single place you go. People will be afraid to eat or sleep or go places because of the fact that diseases are going to be rampant throughout the world. And, uh, and earthquakes in various places. Now, we're just beginning to see an awakening of earthquakes across the world. And uh, you remember one earthquake that... Uh, that happened here a while back in the ocean that caused the tidal wave in Indonesia and killed uh, hundreds and hundreds of people. Uh, that's a small, just a small thing compared to what's going to happen across our world when these earthquakes begin to take place out in the ocean. There's going to be huge cities like New York and others that will be swept away by tidal waves, earth, earthquakes that will, uh, that will literally, the scripture talks about islands, uh, uh, mountains just suddenly disappearing in the ocean and islands, islands being swept away across, across the world. You read the book of Re Revelation and you get some of these ideas of what will happen during that time. But uh, earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, uh, tidal waves, all sorts of things like that that, that really uh, stir fear in the hearts of people and they know not when they're coming. So it's going to be a, a time of fear in the hearts of all men. Uh, earthquakes in various places Notice verse 8, and this says, these are the beginning of sorrows. This is just the beginning of sorrows. This is the beginning of the, the first part of the tribulation period. The tribulation period is broken up into two sections, three and a half years each. The first part of the tribulation is called just the tribulation. The second part is called the great tribulation. 
and intent, the intensity of God's fierce anger and wrath comes, comes out in the second part of the tribulation, and we'll see why in just a moment. So in verse 8 it says, And all these are the beginnings of sorrow. Verse 9, And they shall deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And this, of course, tells us that during this time, when the gospel is being preached and people are being saved, and Christians are going everywhere trying to tell others how they can be saved before the end comes, because of that, there's going to be great, uh, great affliction upon Christians. Uh, the guillotine is going to be brought out during the seven-year tribulation period, and people's, people are going to be killed by lopping their heads off. Literally thousands, probably millions of people will die as a result of the guillotine. So there's going to be great persecution upon those who have trusted Christ as their Savior, and that, of course, will cause people to, to count the cost to tell whether they want to put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and be followers of him or not. Because it, it means if you trust him as your savior and refuse to take the mark of the beast, and this is a mark that's placed on their forehead or on the back of their hand, you refuse to take that mark, it's a death penalty. And so it's going to be uh, an encouragement to lost people when they hear the gospel to reject it. And not only to reject it, but uh, to... to uh, uh, turn against those who, who have trusted Christ as their Savior. So it's going to be a, a hard time, and people are count, going to have to count the cost. Will I, will I live for this short time that I have and be prosperous or be able to eat and have food and all those things? Or am I willing to, take, am I willing to trust Christ, reject the mark of the beast, and, uh, and wait for his coming? So there's going to be great affliction because of that. Um, Verse 9 says, the last part it says, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. You know, that's kind of typical. Uh, people love all kinds of religions, but one thing people despise is the name of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, it tells you there's something different about Jesus. There's something, there's something strong, there's something magnificent, there's something great in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ because he's the, he's the one that people hate. Even now in our public school systems, you find that, that Islam is exalted. And even, they even have classes in public school systems about Islam to teach people how to be, how to be neighborly to, to the uh, Muslim people. But let me tell you something, you, op you open the Bible and the teacher gets kicked out of school, and so does the student. That tells you something about Jesus. He's hated because of who he is. And so we, they're going to be hated during the tribulation period, because they carry the name of our Savior and our God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 10, and then shall many be offended. Here, this is what we've been talking about. They're offended at Christ because if they take the name of Christ, it's going to cause them to be killed. And so that offends people. So they become enemies of Christ and enemies of those that are Christians. And many shall be offended and shall betray one another. So here betrayal takes place. And the scripture tells us, that father will be against son, and son against father. And uh, those, it will be that, that relatives will turn against each other because of, because of Christ and because of what it causes to be a Christian. Many, uh, verse 10, and then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And I think a lot of this has to do with the mark of the beast. Can you imagine your, your son or daughter, your Christian family, your son or daughter comes home and he's got the mark of the beast in his forehead. Wonder what kind of wonder what kind of relationship that's going to cause in the home, in the family, or on the back of his hand. And it's going to cause families to be afraid of those who are relatives that have the mark of the beast. It's going to be a terrible time to live because every person that doesn't take the mark of the beast is going to have to hide somewhere to keep himself from being beheaded. Um, verse 11. And many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many, many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall grow cold. So the Holy Spirit of God in the, in the church, this, is, this speaks well of the church. Because what happens when the church is caught out of the world, uh, iniquity or lawlessness or sin is rampant throughout the world. We, we as a body in the world... Uh, filled with the Holy Spirit and carrying the message of the gospel of Christ hold back the full force of evil in our world right now. If it weren't for Christianity in the world, the world would be like during the tribulation period. So the Holy Spirit is, does, is doing his work in every blessed believer in the world 
that's taking a stand against the things that are evil. So when the Holy Spirit is taken out of the world, he's gone, that is, in the believers. He, the Holy Spirit is still here in his person. The Holy Spirit never leaves. He's everywhere. But the influence of the Holy Spirit through the believer is going to be gone. And when that influence disappears, then there's, there's going to be no, no, law, no law in our world. It's kind of like going to Mexico. You know, you, you go down to Mexico and you run to a police officer and, you, officer and you think, this fellow will help me. No, he might pick your pocket. He might rip you off or take your car from you. And that's the way it's going to be during the tribulation. I don't, I don't mean any, any offense to, uh, to Mexico, uh, but I'm sorry. That's the way a lot of the federalities are down in Mexico. And that's the way it's going to be during the tribulation period. The law will be no, will be no law. And iniquity will abound. There'll be robberies and murders and fights and uh, violence like it was before, uh, before the flood took place. So um, the love of many will grow cold because, because uh, wickedness is everywhere. No one will trust any, anyone else. You know, in, the, in order to love people, you have to have trust. And when trust is gone, love is impossible. So that... that Lack of trust and the lack of uh, law, law in our world will cause people uh, to grow cold. Uh, people will not love their children. We see that happening today. And I think it's because of the influence of wickedness and atheism in our world that girls can go down to the abortion clinic without a thought in their mind about their baby and kill their baby in the womb. I think that's the most un unheard of atrocity that the world could ever think of that a woman who should be protecting her little one in her womb, uh, God has built it in such a way that, uh, that it protects the child, and yet it's the most dangerous place in the world for a child to live today is in the womb of his mother. Because America itself kills uh, one and a half million, one and one half million babies every year. The love of many have already begun, begun to grow cold. Verse 13. But he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. Now, what we're talking about here is those that are not offended. Now, there's going to be people that are offended at Christ, and they will turn from him. And then there are going to be those who are not offended at him, and they will endure. They will have to go through the harsh tribulation. And those who endure this, uh, the harsh persecution of the great tribulation period and go on until the time that Christ comes back again, those will be rescued out. And that's what the word saved means. These are actually saved people that continue on and wait for the coming of Christ. Verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom, it's the same gospel that we have, the gospel of our Savior, the Lord Jesus. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness, and there we have it, a witness to every single person will hear the gospel, uh, a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. And this is the, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God that takes, that picks out these young men and sends them into the darkest parts of, of, of the world, places where there is no electricity or TV or anything. They, God sends these young men down there to give the gospel to those who have never heard it before, and every single person in the whole world will have an opportunity to put their faith and trust in the blessed Savior and be saved. Now let's go to verse 15. Now, when we come into verse 15, this talks about the abomination of desolation. And the abomination of desolation is warned, the Jews were warned of the abomination of desolation in the book of Daniel. And what this actually is about, it's halfway through the tribulation period, this seven years, and the Antichrist, who is the Antichrist, is just what the word says, he's against Christ. He's the a world ruler that arises and takes, play, takes his position and there is a ruler, he midway through the tribulation, although he's pampered the Jews along the first part of the tribulation period, made, made them think that he's almost their Messiah. And then halfway through the tribulation period, he turns against Israel and begins to destroy them. It's also at that same time that he destroys the liberal church. Now there's going to be there's a church existing at this present moment in our world that, that denies the deity of Christ. They're called liberals. Uh, a lot of them have uh, United on the front of their name, United Presbyterian, United Methodist, and, and among those people there are probably some saved people, but, but the churches themselves have denied the Bible, denied the deity of Christ, the virgin birth, 
salvation by faith alone. And so uh, they, have, they have turned away from Christ. And so this, this church, this what we would call the one world church, and that's what the Catholic Church wants. They want, they want the Catholicism to unite with Baptists, Methodists, and Presbyterians, and all those, and, all, and, and other religions, including Islam, and they want to, want to form a one world church. And it does form, and when the Antichrist comes, they help the Antichrist, and they, they're, they're pampered and petted during the first, seven, first three and a half years of the tribulation period, and then halfway through the tribulation, period, uh, the Antichrist arises and destroys them. And that's what they deserve. So they're destroyed as well as the fact that he sets himself up as God. He makes an image of himself and puts it in God's temple in, in Jerusalem and he causes people to worship his image. Now the Bible tells us that this image will actually speak. So some way either by trickery or by sat satanic powers, this this image that's set up is able to speak to people. And so there's gonna, the whole world is required to bow down and worship the image that's in, inside the temple, the image of the Antichrist himself. So this is the beginning of uh, the second half of the tribulation period. It's called the abomination of desolation. Now verse, uh, we're at verse uh, 15. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whosoever reads, let him understand. And here's what it says in verse 16. Then let them that are in Judea flee to the mountains. Now that is those who are in Israel, the area of Israel, there's a place called Petra that God has provided for the, the Jews that are there to escape into the mountain of Petra as a protection against uh, the horrible things that are to come. And as I read this, I wondered, well, what about Jews that are in other parts of the world that when, when this uh, abomination of desolation takes place, they're to head to the hills too. That's basically what it says. Get to the hills. Get out of the, get out of the major uh, social uh, cities and places like that. Get away up into the mountains. And so they immediately are to leave and head for the mountains. Uh, verse uh, 17, let him... Let him who is in the house not come down to take anything out of his house. So it's so urgent that, you, that you, when this is announced, and I think it'll be announced on all the television uh, stations, and there'll be a lot of them throughout the earth at that time, people around the world will hear this announcement about the worship of the Antichrist. And so uh, immediately, don't go back to your house to get your stuff. Let him who's on the house not come down to take anything out of his house. Right now, move, go to the mountains. Neither let him who is in the fields return back to his house or back to his uh, clothes. And woe unto those who are with child and to those who nurse children in those days. But pray that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. And I guess there's a lot of uh, restrictions there that would keep them from going to the mountains. But uh, they, they would, that's where they need to go is immediately to Petra, to the mountains, get out of these centralized areas. And I think the reason for this is I think that God is angry, that God is, is uh, wrathful. Now the word wrath is a little stronger word than the word anger, and I think that God's wrath is stirred up because here's a man who, uh, who claims to be God, who has exalted himself and now despised the holiness and the goodness of God by placing an image in the temple. Kind of reminds me of Antiochus Epiphanes, who was a, a leader back there, who took a sow and slaughtered a sow on the altar of the temple. Some of you probably remember reading that story. And uh, it, was, it was, of course, a pig was an unclean animal and he offered it as a sacrifice in the temple of God. And by that, he, he was spitting in God's face. And that's what this ruler did, the Antichrist does here. He spits in God's face and sets himself up as God, puts his idol in the temple to be worshiped by all people. And I think that one thing brought on the terrible wrath of God upon the earth and all those, uh, all those harsh things that come as a penalty from God upon the earth begin to take place. And that's the reason God said to the Jews, get to the mountains. Because that's the only place that you're going to be sa safe from the, from the harsh trials that will come upon the earth uh, during these last three and a half years. Uh, verse 21. I'm going down through here very quickly and I hope you can pick up the things that I'm saying. But uh, verse 21 says, 
For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not from the beginning of the world to this time, nor ever shall be. So we have never seen or heard of anything on the earth that will be like, like this punishment that God brings upon our world uh, during this time, in the last three and a half years. Verse 22, And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. <clears throat> but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. So because of the fact that there are Christians on the earth, and these are basically it's talking about saved Jews, these, because of the saved people of Israel, that God is going to shorten this horrible uh, punishment upon the earth <clears throat> so that they can be saved. Verse 23, Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, do not believe it. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they should deceive the very elect. So here we're going to see satanic powers and signs that would make people believe that this, that this, uh, this prophet is really a prophet of God. Verse 26, Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, do not go forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, don't believe it. Uh, for as the lightning comes out of the east and shines even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So, hey, if someone tells you this during the tribulation period, you don't have to worry about it because his, his coming is going to be so brilliant and so powerful that no one will miss it. Everyone will see it. I think they'll see it on television first. Uh, you know, if Christ comes from one direction, the other, the, the other side of the earth won't be able to see him. Maybe they'll see the brilliance around the earth, but I think immediately every place in the world they're going to see the, the signs of the coming of Christ uh, in the heavens, the, the glory and the brightness. And I don't think he just suddenly appears. Now, this is just my opinion. But I think it, it probably takes like two or three days, maybe three days for him to completely come from, uh, from where he comes into the earth. And I believe, I believe the brilliance is going to get brighter and brighter and brighter as they see him coming. And the fear is going to build and build and build. And people, the scripture says that great men will hide themselves in the mountains and pray that the rocks will fall on them and kill them. That's how, that's how uh, extreme it's going to be. And so uh, when he comes back, no one will have to guess, I wonder if this is Jesus coming. No, there won't be any wonder about that because there, there's, there's nothing like it that has ever been in his brilliance. Verse 28, for wherever the carcass is, there shall, will be the eagles gathered together. This basically tells us that where, where, where the wickedness is, that's where judgment falls. And so Israel is going to be the center of this because that's where the Antichrist is going to have his, his place set up. And this is where the king is going to come to bring great uh, horror. Now, the scripture tells us that there's going to be two, two basic wars during the tribulation period. About halfway through the tribulation period, Russia is going to come down against the nation of Israel to take a spoil, the Bible says. And as a result of that, Russia and also the hordes of Islam the Muslim people are going to join together with Russia to come down against Israel. And, and God is going to destroy five-sixths of Russia's armies on the hills of Israel. Five-sixths, that's a lot of soldiers. And then the rest of them are going to turn tail and head back to Russia. But I believe that's because of the consistent wickedness that has come out of that country, the, the uh, ungodliness, the communism, and all those things that has been used there to fly in the face of God and turn... Uh, turn people against the Lord. And so this is, this is their punishment. This is Russia's punishment. And not only that, Islam is going to be a part of that. Islam has spread a gospel, of, or I, I won't use the word gospel there. It's a message of wickedness throughout the earth. It's, it's probably one of the most wicked of all religions in the world. Can't be tolerated. God cannot tolerate it. They intend to kill everyone who refuses uh, to be Muslim. And so their, their part with Russia and it's going to be their armies that will be slaughtered in, on the hills of Israel halfway through the tribulation period. And then at the end of the tribulation period, the nation of, uh, of Red China and their 200 million soldiers will come down, cross the Tigris-Euphrates River, and come into the land of Israel. And there the scripture tells us that God will destroy them with the brightness of his coming. Now that's some power. Uh, perhaps it's uh, nuclear power. But whatever power he uses, these people who have, who have for many, many years been atheists and against God and have spoken and threatened those who are Christians, now one day uh, Red China is going to get their comeuppances. 
And God is going to destroy them because of the wickedness they've, all, they've lived all these many years. So, uh, there won't be any question about his coming. When he comes, they'll all, they'll all see him. Now let's go to verse 29. Verse 29 says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, now we're coming toward the end of the tribulation now, the last three and a half years. So it's like, it's like the last, uh, maybe the last six months of the tribulation period. And, that, and you know, that last three and a half years is when Moses and Elijah are sent into the world. God sends his two prophets and they preach for two and a half years and people try to kill them. And when they do, they breathe fire out their mouth and, and kill whoever's, whoever's bothering them. And so they preach for three and a half years. You can imagine the message being heard on television around the world and how much hatred is built up. This, they can't do, the Antichrist can't do anything against them. But then at the last of the tribulation period, they are killed and their bodies, their bodies lie in the street for three and a half days, I believe it is. And then they're raised up from the dead. So these, this is, these, all these signs will take place to these people to repent, and yet they will not. So um, after the, at the end of the tribulation, verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened. So now God turns the lights off everywhere on the earth. The sun shall be darkened, and the moon shall not give its light, and the stars shall fall from heaven. These are not small stars. If you look at this that chart back there on that back wall, you'll see the size of some of the stars that there are in the universe. And uh, great stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. The powers of the universe, of, of God's creation, will be shaken. Verse 30, And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Then when we see him, all these things are going to take place on the earth, and then suddenly people will look up and they see the brightness of it coming. Uh, I, I guess it's going to come from the east. Some say from the north, but I think... It's going to come from the east as lightning shines out of the east and to the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. So, uh, the, uh, verse 30 says, And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. Now, this, we see Christ coming back, uh, and, and when he comes back, the scripture tells us it's going to be thousands and thousands and thousands of angels that come back with him. Not only that, but the saints of God. The church of God is coming back. We're, we're coming back with him in our, uh, dressed in, in our white garments, representing the righteousness of Christ. So it's going to be a huge occasion where, where hordes of angels and saints come back. Tens of thousands and thousands and thousands come back with the Lord Jesus in his coming. And uh, then shall the tribes of the earth mourn. You can imagine why. Now because they see the power of the Son of God that, that they have repudiated all these years and now what has been told them is, is coming to pass, that Jesus Christ, the Lord of heaven, is coming back in power and great glory. And so they mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Hey, that'd make a news story, wouldn't it? That's the message we should be carrying to the world. We have a powerful God and a powerful King, and one day he will come back and rule and reign on the earth for a thousand years, and he will control it all. And, uh, and they will see him too. Verse 31, and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Now this group of people, the elect, are the saved Jews, that have been, the Jews that have been saved during the tribulation period. So God is going to send his angels. Now this is not a rapture, because the rapture took, is, took place at, uh, for the church. The church is the only one that's raptured. So God sends his angels. And so they're going to get an air, a aircraft express from wherever they are in the world. God is going to pick them, pick them up, every saved Jew, and he's going to bring them to Jerusalem where he will establish his kingdom. And that's going to happen at, this, at the end of time. Every saved Jew will be caught out and will be brought to him. Um, from, from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Verse, let's get down to verse 36 now. But of that day, now uh, the, di the disciples are asking, when's that going to take place? And Jesus says, but of that day and hour, no man knows. So no one knew the exact hour, the exact day. Uh, however, the, the tribulation period in itself tells you that there's only seven years. So they could get some inkling of just about what time the Savior's coming by, by the things that the scripture tells. tells. So these Jews, 
that have the Bible, and when people, when people are left on the earth during the tribulation period, they go to the Bible and they find all the instructions there, and they're going to know just about the, the time that the second coming of Christ will take place. So, no one knows the day nor the hour, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. In fact, when Jesus was here, he says, I don't know, but my Father knows. Showing that at one time his, his knowledge was limited because of, he, took, he took flesh and became, he became flesh. But he says his Father only. Now notice verse 37. But as the days of Noah were. Hey, isn't that strange? They tell us there were no days of Noah. There was no worldwide flood. Isn't that strange? Jesus believed, that, believed in Noah and he believed in a worldwide flood. And let me tell you something. If you claim to be a Christian, you, de you deny a worldwide flood and the flood of Noah, you are teaching against God. You are teaching against the scripture. It's very clear in scripture. You are maligning the, the word of God and the son of God. So Jesus says, as it was in the days of Noah. Well, how was it in the days of Noah? In the days of Noah, it was a wicked, a wicked place. Uh, Noah preached, the Bible says Noah preached to them for 120 years. And he, he and his sons and their wives were the only righteous people left on the earth. Out of billions and billions of people that were on the earth at that time, there was not a single person that was righteous. And you know, it's coming to that in our day, that, uh, that it's becoming less and less popular to be a Christian. And so as time goes on and as this tribulation period comes, it's going to be unpopular to be a Christian and, and wickedness will be rampant everywhere. Uh, Verse 38 kind of tells us a little bit about that. Well, verse 37 says, But as it, in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the, in the coming of the Son of Man. So it's going to be a lot of similarities between the, the Noah's flood and the time before it and the time when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back again. Verse 38. For as, for as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. Now it says... They were just living a normal life, eating and drinking and marrying and getting married. No, what it means is they were living a riotous life. They were getting drunk. They were, they, they, all their mind was, was on, was completely on, was wickedness, uh, sexual things, drunkenness. And that's basically what was taking place during, during the uh, time before the flood. And so he says that's exactly what, what it's going to be like before the coming of the Son of Man. That's what... The tribulation world is going to be like. It's going to be a wicked, wicked world. And uh, verse 39 says, let's read verse 38 again. For as, of days, as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and knew not. That is, they had no comprehension of what was going to take place now. Can you imagine how horrible that would be? Uh, all of a sudden, uh, you're living a normal life and then... Then uh, the, it clouds up and begins to rain, and it rains for 40 days and 40 nights. At the same time, the great deeps give up the water, belch up the water that's from underneath them, and, and tons and tons and uh, floods of water just suddenly come in and destroy everything. People run for the high hills, but there are no high hills because they're all covered. So every single person on the face of the earth, thousands and thousands and thousands of people died as a result of drowning. Now, they had been told, Noah told them, he preached as much as he possibly could, but they really, it didn't register with them. And now suddenly, the flood has come, and there's no place to hide, and they're dead. That's the way it will be during, during the tribulation period. Uh, they, uh, they knew not, verse 39 says, they knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And that's the way it's going to be when Christ comes back. Then he goes on to describe, describe it in verse 40. Then shall two be in a field, one shall be taken and the other left. Now this is not the rapture either. It, if you notice when the flood came, God took the wicked. He killed the wicked, didn't he? And so it is when Christ comes back, there'll be two uh, in the field, one will be taken, that is God kills him and takes him to hell immediately. This is what's going to be throughout all the world. So there's one saved, one lost, the lost will immediately be killed and sent to hell. In verse, uh, verse 40. Verse 41 says, Two women shall be grinding at the mill. The one shall be taken and the other's left. So the one that's taken is the one that's taken to judgment. Immediately to judgment. 
So the, the whole world is going to be under this, uh, under this judgment when Christ comes back. The, the saved you will be caught out. Uh, the, the, verse 40 says, Then shall two be in a field, one shall be taken and the other left. And this is the time when the, those who have taken the mark of the beast, both Jews and Gentiles, when Christ comes back, those that have the mark will immediately be killed and sent to judgment. And those that do not have the mark will not be sent to hell at this time. Now verse 42. Watch therefore. Now this word watch, it's, it's, it's specifically to those guys that lived during the tribulation period. Let me tell you something. It, it pertains to us. It pertains to us because we need to be watching for the coming of Jesus. We need to be living in such a way that we will be glad to see him come, that we will not be ashamed to stand before him in the presence of his judgment. So what the warning in here is here is watch, because we don't know today whether we're going to get home from here before the rapture takes place. We could be caught up in a moment of time. Jesus could come before, before I finish this message. And so that's what the scripture teaches. And some say, well, are you trying to scare us? Yes. I guess that's, what the, that's what's intended in these verses. Some people say, well, I don't believe in preaching a, a scary gospel to make people get saved. Hey, this is scary. This is scary. There's nothing left after death but hell for those who reject the gospel of Christ. And when Jesus comes back in the rapture, you're left for a, a terrible time in the great tribulation period. You better watch. You better be on guard. You better be prepared. That's what watch means. Be prepared. Verse 42, watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord comes. And we don't know either. And we need to be ready. Verse 43. But know this, that if the householder had known in what watch of the thief of the night would come, he would have watched and would not have allowed his house to be broken into. That is, if the thief, if the thief called up and said, hey, I'm going to rob your house tonight. Is that the way thieves do? No, that's not the way thieves do. The thieves wait until they think you're not there. Then they come and they steal from your house. And, and th no one's going to come to you say, and say, Jesus is coming today. He's coming tonight. Or he's coming at this hour or that hour. Because it's going to be like, like a thief in the night when he comes. And no one knows the time nor the hour. So be sure that you're ready. Verse 44. Therefore be you also ready. For in such an hour as you think, the Son of Man comes. So... It's when you think he's not coming, that's when he's coming. That's what it says. When you think, no, he's not coming. And that's what the, uh, the atheists are saying. Where is the promise of his coming, they say. For since the fathers have fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning. Therefore, because he hasn't come yet, he's not coming. That's, that's a time when you do not think he's coming. And that's when it will take place. Now, you need to ask yourself, after this message that we've talk to you this morning, you need to ask yourself this question. Am I ready to meet the Lord Jesus? Am I ready to stand in his presence? Am I ready to be judged by him? Well, can I stand before him unashamed? Uh, young people, let me say this to you. And I, I wish I had more young people here. Young people have a tendency to be uh, self-deceiving. They make themselves believe that they're saved when they're not. You know, if you're 12 or 13 years old and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, no matter, you may say that you have, but you, if your life is not a born-again life, you can go to hell just like adults can. can. You go to hell just the same as mom and dad or older people. Uh, 14, 13, 14-year-old 14 kids go to hell just like everybody else does. Moms and dads, you need to realize that, and you need to be sure that your children are saved. Be sure they have, they have Christ literally in their heart. They've been transformed by his power. They've been given the new birth. They have the Holy Spirit. They need to have all that. And I'm afraid too many parents take for granted because they made some sort of child decision when they were six or eight years old that their child saved. That's not what counts. It's faith and transformation of the soul that really counts. Be sure your children are saved. And be sure that you're saved. That's the important thing. I'd like for us to stand together for the closing time.